In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. In my estimation, one of the greatest displays of God's love and mercy was during the period of Joseph's engagement to Mary. And after she broke the news to him, that she was pregnant. He must have tossed and turned that night feeling fearful, feeling hurt, feeling betrayed, feeling angry, disappointed at Mary's seeming infidelity. But God did this. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 the last part of verse 20, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Matthew 1, 20. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, if you really think about that, I don't know how much of a relief that was, because I'm thinking in Joseph's mind, he was saying, okay, so now what do I do with that? But still, it relieved his fears that Mary had not been untrue to him. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We read in Luke 1.31, you don't have to turn there, but the angel Gabriel had told Mary also that her child's name was to be Jesus. Jesus is an anglicized version of the Greek version of his name. But in Hebrew, in the original language, it's Yeshua. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua, short for Yehoshua. And that comes from the personal name for God in Hebrew, Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E and what that meant in the Hebrew was to save or to deliver. So Yeshua means God saves, God delivers, God helps. Jesus' very name points to his role and his purpose in coming to this earth. Every time we say his name, say the name Jesus. Jesus. Every time we say his name, we are acknowledging him as our Savior, our Deliverer, our Rescuer, our Helper. I want you to say those four words. He is our Savior, Deliverer, Rescuer, Helper. Jesus. Hallelujah. Turn with me, please. 
Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, or Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. This is the second Sunday of Advent. The theme is love. God's love, our love for one another. But what we're looking at, first of all, is the fact that we needed a Savior. What does it mean to call Jesus a Savior? Why do we need a Savior? What do we need saving from? And how does he save us? Have you ever asked somebody or been asked the question, are you saved? It was kind of a bigger thing maybe back in the 70s, 80s, I don't know. We use a different language maybe now. If time allowed, I would love to sit across a table from you and hear your testimony. God orchestrates each of our lives uniquely to draw us to himself. And I would love to hear what went into his saving you. Salvation is kind of like a big painting, big brush strokes here of God's love, brush strokes here of God's mercy, what he saved us from, brush strokes of God's grace, what he's given us that we didn't deserve, brush strokes of God's forgiveness. That's salvation. We're saved, first of all, from sin. In the Old and the New Testament, in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the word for sin was hata, H-A-T-A. In the New Testament, in Greek, the word for sin was hamartia, hamartia. They both mean to stray from the path or miss the mark. Now, both... Julius and Jeremy were into archery in high school. They know about hitting the mark, right? Target store has the big target emblem, right? You shoot for the bullseye. There's nothing like a bullseye. But to sin means to miss the mark. Every one of us, because of our sinful nature, has missed the mark. There is a right path, there is a mark, there is an ideal that we are meant to follow. But just as the old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, says, Our nature is prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Isn't that what sin is? We are prone to go our own way. We all think we've got a better idea. We're even prone to leave the God we love. Sin is used to describe in the New Testament both the inner inclination to stray from God's path and the actual act of straying from it. So it's what's going on in our heart as well as the act of sin. God's path, his target, is outlined throughout Scripture. We have the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. We have the Old Testament prophets. We have Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In the New Testament, we have his parables. We have the teaching of the apostles. 
In Micah 6, 8, it simply says, what does God require of you but to do, do justice, to love mercy or demonstrate loving kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? In the New Testament, practical ways of living out love. Sharing food with the hungry, clothing the naked, having compassion for the sick, the stranger, the prisoner. Then there was the golden rule, do, come on we're all rangers, do unto others as you'd have them do to you. And Jesus summed it all up when he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, everything you got inside and outside, love the Lord your God. Sometimes it's a feeling, sometimes it's a doing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and... Love your neighbor as yourself. Adam Hamilton wrote in his book called Incarnation, If everyone walked this path, we would have no wars, we would need no prisons, and we wouldn't see refugee crises or have a world where people die of malnutrition, and I would add, are not sexually trafficked. There would be no more racism or bigotry. All marriages would survive. There would be no sexual assault, no cruelty, no dishonesty or unkindness anymore. But that is not the world we live in. Why don't we have that kind of world? The Christian answer is sin. Missing the mark. And sin brings with it suffering, alienation, guilt, and shame. It all goes back to the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam and Eve the entire garden. They were disallowed from eating the fruit of one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan, through the serpent, led them to believe that God didn't want them to eat of that fruit because it would make them like him. It would make them little gods, which is what he wanted to be, right? He led them to believe it was completely unfair of God to disallow them from eating the fruit of that tree. They had the whole rest of the garden. But he led them to believe God was unfair because he wouldn't let them eat of that one tree. So, what is the forbidden fruit the serpent beckons me to eat. What lie does he tell you to trip you up and lead you astray? Where do we stray from the path or miss the mark? Jesus' death on the cross, which I love they portrayed in the videos this morning. Jesus' death on the cross makes it possible for us to be redeemed, restored, reconciled to God, justified, and forgiven. He is our Savior. Savior. D. Deliver. Deliver. Oh, we're so confident. Deliverer. R. Rescuer. <laughs> H. Nobody wants to answer. Healer. Let's say them all together. Savior. Deliverer. Rescuer. Healer. Christ's death on the cross was an act of selfless love. It wasn't the nails that held him on the cross. It was his love for you and me. We cannot save ourselves, but God in his great love for us comes to us in Jesus to save us from our sin and its consequences, to redeem us, to restore us, 
and to heal us. And that reminds me of one of the most theologically sound Christmas carols that was ever written. Hark, the herald angels sing. When I was a kid, I thought it was Hark the Herald. I didn't know what that meant until I actually saw it written out. There's an exclamation point after the word hark. That means hear, hark. The herald angels sing. One of the verses says this, Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son, S-U-N, of righteousness. Through him, the light of God's righteousness shines. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. What kind of healing? Physical healing? Yes. But most of all, first of all, healing from sin. Reconciling us to God. Risen with healing in his wings, mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give us second birth. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach a sermon on that. That's a threat, okay? I'm going to preach a sermon on that song because there is so much theology there. Go home, look it up, sing it to yourself. Jesus saves us both from our inner tendency to sin and the guilt and shame we carry when we do sin. Adam Hamilton writes this, it's not the temptation completely vanishes from our lives, but we find a new, stronger impulse pulling us toward the right path. We find our hearts transformed little by little. As our inner nature is being changed, our thoughts, our words, and deeds change, and we find ourselves more often and intentionally walking the good path. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 and 11 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. You and I live the Christian life not on our own power. It's by his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because the devil will never tell you the truth. He will never be straight up with you. He will always lie. He will always cheat. He will always deceive. So we have to be ready to come against the wiles of the devil. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and what? He will flee from you. Just keep saying no and he'll get bored. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Another hymn. Martin Luther, I did preach a sermon on this song. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, isn't that one of our letters this morning? What is it? Savior, deliverer, rescuer, helper, healer, helper, healer. <laughs> our helper, he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. In other words, he's our helper in this world that we live in. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Thus ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth, Lord of the hosts, from age to age the same, and he must 
win the battle. He's our helper. He's our rescuer. He's our deliverer. He's our savior. We're saved from sin. We're saved from hopelessness, meaninglessness, and despair. Sometimes we wonder if our life is really worth living. We go through health problems. We lose loved ones. We go through failures and setbacks. And we wonder, is it really worth it? People who are walking through COVID have had those thoughts. Jesus' ministry said the very same thing to prostitutes, demoniacs, divorcees, lepers, chronically ill, mentally ill, those marginalized by the religious leaders. He said, you matter to God. Your life has meaning. God isn't finished with you yet. Turn to the person next to you as close as you can and tell them God isn't finished with you yet. In his death for us on the cross, Jesus was saying to all humanity, your life has value. Your sins are forgiven. God loves you. Adam Hamilton again writes, he conveyed this by the way he healed the sick. He communicated it in the parables of Lazarus and the rich man, the prodigal son, and the sinner and the tax collector. He demonstrated it in his care for the woman caught in adultery, his offer of living water to the woman at the well, his words of affirmation to Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and his call of Matthew, the tax collector. What's the big deal about a tax collector? They were the most hated citizens in the country. Because they not only collected taxes, they pocketed some of it for themselves. But Jesus chose Matthew. He chose Zacchaeus. He showed it in his close relationship with Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. His healing of the demon-possessed man who lived among the tombs. His calling of the fishermen to be his disciples. And many more acts of outreach and welcome to those who needed him. He showed these people that God wanted them. In Jesus, God came to us to save us from the despair that comes from believing there's no meaning to life or to our lives in particular. He came to save us from our sense that we have no value or worth and that there's no reason to go on. He came to rescue us from feeling there is no hope. With him by our side, there is always hope. He is our savior, deliverer, rescuer, helper. There's a Christmas song. I don't know if I've ever heard it before. If I have, I, I didn't hear it. <laughs> it's called Love Came Down at Christmas. It was written by Christina Rossetti. We're going to play it right now. Let it speak to you. Let it, let it touch your heart. Love Came Down at Christmas.
God loves us so much. He gave his one and only son. He gave him to die. He loved us so much that through Jesus' death, he defeated and destroyed our greatest enemy and our biggest fear, and that's death. We read in Hark the Herald Angels Sing, He was born that man no more may die. If we leave this body, that's just leaving this body. Our spirits live on for eternity in one of two places. And we choose that place in this life by accepting or rejecting God's gift of love. Jesus said, because I live, you too shall live. Hallelujah. The angel told Joseph in a dream to give Mary's child the name Jesus. God saves. The angels brought good news of great joy to the shepherds, telling them that day in the city of David was born a Savior. Jesus saves us from sin, from guilt, from shame. He rescues us from loveless, meaningless, and hopeless lives. And in the end, he delivers us from death. This is why we call him Savior, Deliverer, Rescuer, Helper. Let's close our eyes. Lord, thank you that you are our Savior. You are our Deliverer. You are our rescuer, and you daily are our helper. Lord, in these moments, we receive you as our savior, our deliverer, our rescuer, our helper. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Save me, literally, from myself. We thank you, God, for your love that gave and continues to give. Inviting us even this morning to receive more and more of your love. Thank you, Lord, that you never change. You never love us more on Tuesday and less on Friday. Your love is constant. Your love is sure. Your love is eternal. Your love doesn't pick favorites. Your love is who you are. God is love. And you demonstrated your love in this, that while we were still sinners, Jesus came. Jesus came. Bring us God's love. Lord, this morning, I receive your love anew. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that you love me. Thank you, God. I receive your love. I thank you for your love. And I walk out of here this morning, Lord, knowing, being confident that I am loved by Almighty God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name.